What's up my stat stars, Michael Princhuk here, ready to talk to you about sampling distributions for sample means. A gigantic topic that I'm gonna teach you in a very short amount of time. Now this is a really cool topic and at the end of the day, what we're gonna do is we're gonna build a model for what a sampling distribution for sample means looks like. Now right now you might be like, I don't even know what that is, but by the end of the video, it's gonna make complete sense. And to introduce this topic and to talk about the topic throughout the video, we're gonna be talking about Goliath bullfrogs. The Goliath bullfrog is one of the largest frogs on earth. It has a mean weight of 4.25 pounds and a standard deviation of 0.90 pounds. Now, we call these two values population parameters because they're numerical values that are true for the entire population of Goliath bullfrogs. Now, the symbol we use for the population mean is mu. It's a Greek letter, kind of looks like a U. And the symbol we use for the standard deviation of a population is sigma, another Greek letter, kind of looks like an O. Now, any one individual bullfrog within the population is going to vary. Not one bullfrog is guaranteed to be 4.25 pounds, could be, could be a little bit more, could be a little bit less, and that's of course why we have the standard deviation with it. Now, let's say we were to look at a random sample of 35 Goliath bullfrogs. Now, from that sample, we could collect what we call a sample mean. This would be the mean of just our sample. This is what we call a statistic because it's something that is a numerical value that comes from a sample. Now the symbol we use for the sample mean is X bar. It's literally just an X, a little bar over top of it. Now the sample mean can be viewed as a continuous random variable. That's because at the end of the day, the mean of a sample is a numerical value that technically has infinite possibilities as to what it could be. Now, before we go any further, we gotta talk about the first big condition that must be true for, well, everything I'm teaching in this video to make sense. And that is that the sample must be random. Now, if it's not random, then that means we allow a little bit of bias to creep, creep in. And if our sample has bias, then we're certainly not going to get what we expect. For example, if out of convenience, we just selected 35 glide bullfrogs from the same pond. Well, that pond could known to have some kind of toxic waste in it, and because that toxic waste, every bullfrog in that pond is absolutely ginormous, so our sample means ends up being absolutely huge, way, way, way above the mean of 4.25, but that's because it wasn't a random sample. So we can't allow that to happen, so all samples must be random or throw them out. Now, back to our random sample of 35 Goliath bullfrogs. Now imagine we collected that sample, weighed them all, and we got a sample mean of, well, what would the sample mean be? Well, I guess it all depends, but we would certainly expect it to be 4.25 pounds because that's what's true for the population. But one thing is guaranteed to be true, and that is that samples do one thing very, very well, and that's that they vary. See what I did there? V-E-R-Y, V-A-R-Y, okay, you get it. Now, because samples vary a lot, I'm not guaranteed to get 4.25 pounds, even though I expect it. My sample could be something more, something less, who knows? So let's just say that I collect my sample of 35 Goliath bullfrogs, and I get a sample mean of 4.36 pounds. Okay, a little bit more than we thought. But what if we went and got a second sample of 35 random Goliath bullfrogs? What would we expect for this sample? Well, we would still expect 4.25 pounds, but we know that, again, samples do vary, and we probably should not expect to get 4.36 again. That's what our other sample got us. I mean, I guess we could, but that would be kind of weird if we got two samples in a row that were both 4.36 pounds. The point is that samples vary, and this is due to something called sampling variability. Sampling variability is the complete natural occurrence of, well, exactly what I've been trying to tell you right now, and that's that samples vary. They not only vary from themselves, but they also vary from the population mean as well. But let's just not stop there. Let's imagine if we kept sampling, sample after sample after sample, 35 Goliath bullfrogs, 35 Goliath bullfrogs, 35, 35, 35, and we did this like a whole bunch of times, and from every sample we got a sample mean. Well, we'd end up with a whole bunch of X bars. And this brings us to our second big condition that must be true for, again, everything in this video to be true. The many, many, many samples that we're analyzing must be independent of each other. And the only way that we can guarantee that independence is if we replace our sample after we analyze it. So take a sample, replace it, take a sample, replace it before selecting our next sample. Well, who has time for that? So in most situations, we actually don't sample without replacement. But that's totally okay as long as we meet what's called the 10% condition. The 10% condition says this. 
If you are sampling without replacement, you are allowed to still assume independence as long as your sample size n is less than 10% of the population. So as long as we can assume that 35 bullfrogs is under 10% of all of them, then we're safe to assume that our samples are going to be independent even if technically they're not. We're okay. Again, we have to have independence or we have to be able to assume independence. And as long as our sample size is under 10% of the population, we could do that. Now let's go back to our many samples. For starters, let's say we just looked at 100 samples, each containing 35 glyph bullfrogs, and from every one of those 100 samples, we got a sample mean. So again, we're gonna end up with 100 X bars, and with those 100 X bars, we can make a graph of them. And here is that graph of the 100 sample means. Every single dot you see here represents the mean of a sample of 35 bullfrogs. So we see the sample means range from roughly 3.8 pounds to roughly 4.6 pounds, but the majority of the sample means were near 4.25 pounds, which is located in the center. Now this is the start of what we call a sampling distribution for sample means. Recall a distribution simply shows us what values the continuous random variable takes on and how often it takes on those values. Officially, a sampling distribution of a statistic is the distribution of values for the statistic for all possible samples of a given size from a given population. Now in our problem, the statistic is the sample mean weight, the sample size is 35, and the population is Goliath bullfrogs. So you see, the graph that we were just looking at is the start of a sampling distribution. Remember, it only had 100 sample means, so imagine a graph that contained all possible sample means from all possible samples of size 35 taken from Goliath bullfrogs. Now for us to create a true sampling distribution for the sample mean weight of Goliath bullfrogs, we would again have to sample every possible sample of size 35 from the population of Goliath bullfrogs, and that, well, is pretty much impossible. But here's the crazy cool thing. Sampling distributions are very, very predictable. We don't have to look at all possible sample means to actually be able to model what a sampling distribution will look like. Sampling distributions have three qualities that are true for all of them when it comes to sample means. Let's take a look at them. The center of a sampling distribution for sample means is literally the mean of all the sample means, and that will be the true population mean. So again, the mean of all the sample means X bar is equal to the true population mean. Now I know what you're thinking. You're like, wait a minute, mu equals mu, uh, duh. Well, no, these two mu's are actually very, very different. The one on the right-hand side is the mean of the entire population. The one on the left-hand side is the mean of all X bars. It's the mean of all the sample means. That's why putting that little subscript there matters. So technically speaking, these two mu's are different. One is the mean of the population, one is the mean of a bunch of sample means. But what we're trying to tell you is that in a sampling distribution where we have a bunch of sample means, the mean of all the sample means will be equal to the true population mean right smack dab in the center. Now, all of those samples are sure to vary, so we could also measure that variation with the standard deviation. This is the standard deviation of the sample means. Again, it's the standard deviation of all those sample means. Now we have a formula to actually construct this standard deviation for us. We take sigma, that's the standard deviation of the population, and divide it by the square root of our sample size. Now same thing I said a moment ago. You might be like, wait a minute, sigma and sigma? No, look, the sigma on the right-hand side is the standard deviation of the population. The sigma on the left-hand side with that little subscript is the standard deviation of a bunch of sample means. Hopefully that makes sense. Now, because the n is in the denominator, I know it's in a square root, but it's still in the denominator, this means that bigger samples vary less. As your sample size gets bigger and bigger and bigger, your standard deviation is going to get lower and lower and lower, because that's what happens when you divide by a bigger number. Now, what this means is that, like I said earlier, we always expect a sample to be the truth. For our bullfrogs, that's 4.25 pounds. But the bigger the sample, the closer it should be to that truth. Because again, bigger samples vary less. 
but smaller samples vary more. If that n the denominator is a smaller number, then the standard deviation of our sampling distribution is going to be bigger, and that means that, well, <laughs> samples are gonna be all over the place. Could be really high or could be really low, because smaller samples are not nearly as accurate as bigger samples. So the sample size all has to do with accuracy. Bigger samples are gonna be more accurate, which means a smaller standard deviation for the sampling distribution, and smaller samples are gonna be less accurate. Now the final characteristic that is true for all sampling distributions for sample means is that the shape is going to be, you guessed it, normal. But here comes that third condition that must be met, forget everything I'm talking about in this video to be true. And that is, well, how do we know the sampling distribution for sample means will be normal? Well, there's actually kind of two rules here. First, if the population that your samples are being taken from is already approximately normal, then the sampling distribution will guarantee to be normal no matter the sample size. You, you could have a sample size of two, five, 10, 300, it doesn't matter. The sampling distribution will be normal because the population that the samples all came from was already normal. But what if the population that the samples come from was either unknown, not given to you, or literally known to be not normal. Well, this is where we need something called the central limit theorem. The central limit theorem tells us that the sampling distribution for sample means will be normal as long as your sample size is big enough, and for us that means 30 or larger. So as long as your sample size is 30 or larger, it doesn't even matter what the population looks like. It can be skewed left, skewed right, just simply be unknown. So here's the two things to know that the sampling distribution for sample means will be normal. One, if your population is already normal, any sample size will do, doesn't even matter at all. But if your population is unknown or known not to be normal, we do need the sample size to be 30 or larger for the central limit theorem to kick in and tell us that that sampling distribution will be normal. Now let's go back and take a quick look at that sampling distribution that we started. This was our distribution of 100 sample means. By no means is this a true sampling distribution because it only has 100 samples. A sampling distribution needs to have all of them. But anyway, all three characteristics that I just got done talking to you about are evident in this distribution. First, look at the center, 4.25. And look at the fact that there is going to be a standard deviation because these samples definitely vary. Some are more than 4.25 and some are less. And look at the shape. You guessed it, approximately normal. So even though we only looked at 100 samples and not all of them, we could still see those three characteristics shining through already. Now, truth be told, we can never actually create a full sampling distribution when our population is so big because, again, we can never actually look at all those samples. But because we know those three facts that I just talked to you about, we can model what that sampling distribution will look like. So let's go back and let's pretend that all we know is that the mean weight of Goliath bullfrogs is 4.25 pounds and the standard deviation is 0.9 pounds. And we're going to look at samples of size 35. So what we could do with this information, again, all the information we need is the mean, the standard deviation, and the sample size. And with that information, we could build a sampling distribution that's going to show us what all possible sample means could look like, and we don't even have to look at a single sample. Crazy but that's how predictable sampling distributions are. First, the mean of our sampling distribution, again, the mean of all the sample means, is going to be the truth, 4.25, as long as our samples are random to avoid bias. The standard deviation of the sampling distribution is going to be taking the population standard deviation, 0.9, and dividing it by the square root of 35, and we get 0.152. So the 0.9 is what one bullfrog could vary by, right? In the population, one bullfrog could vary by as much as 0.9 or maybe even 2.9s or even maybe 3.9s. That would not be strange at all. But we're not looking at one bullfrog. We're looking at the mean of 35. And at 35 is much bigger than one. So the standard deviation for a sample should be lower. And that's why it is 0.152. Now the shape of the sampling distribution is of course going to be normal. Why? Well, if you go back, we never said that the population of Goliath bullfrogs was normal. In fact, we never even said anything about the shape of the population, but that's okay because the central limit theorem says the shape of the sampling distribution will be normal since our sample size is 30 or larger, and of course 35 is. So here is that model. 
right smack dab in the middle, we see the mean of all the sample means, 4.25. I went up 0.152 two, three times. Well, I went up by 0.152 one, two, three times. You get it? And then I went down 0.152, down another, down another to get my three standard deviations on each side. And of course, we see that beautiful model that is normal. So that is what a sampling distribution for sample means is. It's a model that represents all possible sample means from all possible samples of a certain size taken from a certain population. So once we have this model built with the mean, the standard deviation, and of course the shape, then it turns into a probability distribution. And with that probability distribution, we could find the probability of given intervals within that distribution. Let's take a quick look at an example of what I'm talking about right now. Let's say we were asked to find the probability that a sample of 35 Goliath bullfrogs has a mean weight less than 3.85 pounds. Now, anytime I'm asked the probability question, the first thing is I notate it. We're trying to find P for probability, and inside the parentheses is what we're trying to find the probability of, a sample mean X bar being less than 3.85 pounds. Now, to answer this question, the first thing I got to do is build my model, which of course we've already done. Here is that sampling distribution that represents all possible sample means. Got my 4.25, got my standard deviation, got my shape. Now what we want to do is locate the sample mean we're asked about, 3.85. So here it is we located, and it's really kind of on the low side. It looks to be almost three standard deviations below the mean. And we want to find the area below it, which looks really, really, really tiny. Now to find that area, what we need to do is figure out the z-score for 3.85 because then we could use the standard normal model, which is represented with z-scores. So of course we're simply going to find the z-score for 3.85 by subtracting the mean, 4.25, divided by the standard deviation of the sampling distribution, 0.152, and we get negative 2.632. Now, once we have that z-score, we could then go to a normal z-table or use normal CDF on your calculator to find the proportion or the area or the probability that we are below that z-score on the standard normal model. So, find the probability that a sample mean is less than 3.85 is equivalent to find the probability a z-score is less than negative 2.632 on the standard normal table. And then to find that probability, I am actually going to go grab normal CDF on my T84 calculator. Our lower value is going to be negative 99. That's acting like way down towards negative infinity. And our upper value is going to be that negative 2.632. And we get a probability of 0 0.00425 or about 0.424%. Now that's very, very, very unlikely, which tells me that a sample of 3.85 or lower should, well, not occur. It's, don't want to say impossible, but really, really low, definitely under 1%. So if this type of sample did occur, I would probably start to question is the mean and the same deviation that I read about offline that, that got me that 4.25 and got me that 0 0.90 for the same deviation, are those numbers correct? Because a sample of 3.85 or lower would be pretty unlikely, but that's a different topic for a different day. All I'm trying to show you here is that the, the model that we just built is a probability distribution, so we could use it to find probabilities of intervals. We can look below values, above values, or even in between two values. All right, that's it for how to build and exactly what is a sampling distribution for sample means. Hopefully it wasn't too bad. There's really just a couple things you have to keep in mind is that a sampling distribution for sample means represents all possible sample means taken from all possible samples of a given size from a given population. And to build that model, we actually don't have to look at any samples at all. We just have to know the mean of the population mu, the standard deviation of the population sigma, and of course our sample size. Then we could find the center, the spread, and the shape using what I've taught you in this video. Overall, not too difficult, pretty simple, but it's really important that you understand how to build that model and, well, actually what it represents. But don't forget about those three conditions either. Samples have to be random, they have to be independent, and they have to be big enough to be normal. All right, see you guys in the next video. Can't wait.